So the question today that we need to ask ourselves is why are we here? Why did we come and attend this event today? All over Montreal, alhamdulillah, with the grace of God, there are people, Muslims, followers of Ahlul Bayt all around Montreal. Right now as we speak, in an hour, in two hours, some in three hours, they are all commemorating, mourning, remembering, bringing to their consciousness the message and the eternal call of Imam Hussein. All of them are, are resonating from that same, same point, the point from which Imam Hussein had called for the truth and had called for the revival of Islam. All of them are speaking into the world, adding to the cries, adding to the shouts, the screams, the words, the tears, and calling for remembering and bringing to our consciousness what all of this means. All of them are doing good and all of them are going to be rewarded according to their intentions. And all of them are needed. But what makes us different over here? The reason why we are here today right now and the reason why we have been doing this now for the last two, three years is because we wanted to do something genuine in which we come together no matter where we're from, no matter what our background was, no matter how we came here, to commemorate Imam Hussein as one and to remember that our destiny is going to be one as well if we take that path. They say that the ways to... So, so for that reason, for the last... This is the third year that we have been commemorating the Ansar night a night in which uh, the friends of Imam Hussein, as we are today, came from different places around the world, different social classes, different economical status, different colors, different tribes, and they all came, and that did not become a barrier for them. If you lift, if, uh, if I ask over here how many people come from, from Iraq, could you guys raise your hands? Those who come from Iraq, please raise your hands. Can I ask the people who come from Lebanon to raise their hands as well? Those are the people from Lebanon. How about the people who are Canadian Muslims? We are all Canadian Muslims. But those who are, who are not first generation or second generation Canadians, could you raise your hand? Sister Fatima Bolia. How are you doing? I know your hand is hurt, so that's probably why you didn't want to raise it. How many people are Khojas? Raise their hand. How many people are Pakistani? Raise their hand. Inshallah, they're on their way. <laughs> Iranians. Right? How many people are mixes of those? Raise their hand. Alhamdulillah. And this is, inshallah, only the beginning. And that's why we're coming here, because we want to commemorate the message of Imam Hussein the way Imam Hussein himself wrote it. But I want to step back a little bit. They say that the ways to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are as the numbers of the breaths of all creation. They're uncountable practically by us. And I want to share with you a couple of stories that help us to understand what it means to be an Ansar. What would it have been like for them, perhaps? I'm sure that you might have might be more in touch with that than me, but it so happens that I'm the the MC today. So I want to share with you how I get a sense and a feeling of what the Ansar were like. What would they have been living? What it would have been like to be with Imam Hussein, to actually want to die with him when the whole world has abandoned him? What would it have been like? So I started introspecting and looking back and I want to share with you two stories. Since I was a child, uh, I had great parents, alhamdulillah, and uh, many people to help me find my way. Amongst those people was my father. My father was a great man, alhamdulillah, he's still alive and he will have a long life and a good end, inshallah. And amongst the things, there was times where, amongst the things that my father did really, really well with us, was that he would wake us up for Fajr. It was something that he did. And we would all wake up, we were sleepy, didn't want to pray. 
maybe I didn't want to pray, I don't know about my sisters, don't want to generalize. And uh, just wanted to sleep and finish with it. But my father kept doing it and we, after day after day, as we continued to follow this with him, I started seeing something about my father that I didn't know. There was a side about him that I only experienced at Fajr time. Fajr time and before Fajr as well, that was when my father was the most serene. That was when he was most connected. That was when he was overflowing with love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, in Lebanese culture, we tend to be uh, a little bit hot-tempered. Uh, needless to say, at Fajr time, he was extremely calm. He was, he, was, he was glowing. And I began to appreciate the power of Fajr. It actually, and, and the night prayer as well, it actually, I knew that I couldn't, as much as I wanted to fool around and maybe go into things that weren't right, I knew that I was going to lose something extremely precious if I missed, if I went too far. I knew that Islam was haq. And there's something really special about Islam. And I saw it a lot, the most. I saw it, I experienced it at Fajr time. So Fajr time became my, it became my sacred home, my, my, uh, my refuge, the, my seclusion, the time when I actually go into the Ghar of Hira as Prophet Muhammad used to do. And it, it was something sacred. And this continued in my life. One day, of course, as in all families, there was an incident in which I had an argument with a member of my family. There was a disagreement, and like all families, there was one that happened at Fajr time. That was the first time in my life that it ever happened at Fajr time. And uh, alhamdulillah, I mean, it's a normal, healthy, let's say, argument, I guess. But it was an argument, and it happened at Fajr time. And I felt that Fajr time was violated. This was the first time that I knew what it was like for the sacred time to actually be violated. And I started crying about it. I started crying. Imagine, I was crying because Fajr time was being violated. Because something that I knew its sanctity and I experienced it, I felt it was violated in the way that I behaved, in the way that some of my family uh, members behaved at that point in time. We all do mistakes. And I started crying and crying. And I realized, oh my God, now I know what it means to cry for Imam Hussain. Imam Hussain was Fajr prayer, he was Dhuhr prayer, he was Asr prayer, he was Maghrib, he was Isha, he was the night prayer. Imam Hussain was the Qur'an that we read during Fajr. So it is most befitting to cry for Imam Hussain. I want to give you another story. I went to a camp, and this is somebody a lot of you know. It was somebody called, somebody that's still alive today and doing well, shedding the light of Islam making it glow all around the world. His name is Hassanin Rajab Ali, and I'm happy to say his name by, express his name by name on the podium today. <clears throat> I had the privilege of actually going to his camp for two years now. And this man, I saw him when he was here uh, in 2000 and 2001, he was great. But there was something else about him in 2008 and 2010. Something else about him because it's been ten, eight years or nine years more that he has been in the service of Islam, that he has been losing sleep, that he has been facing hardship. And he started to glow in 2008. He was glowing. I was connected to him. But that wasn't the end of the story. I went to see him in 2010 today, uh, last this year. And I, I saw him, how he was working. There was an energy about that place. It's in Michigan. They have a camp there. It's a beautiful facility. It is all dedicated to the, our Imam, may God hasten his return. And the energy there was so powerful. It was so, it was something I had not seen yet before. Again, he would not sleep at night. I remember him before Fajr time. He was sitting on the couch, like imagine the couch is over there. There was a couch in the cafeteria. He had a sweatshirt with a hood on, the one that we generally wear. He had the hood on his head and he was sitting on the couch. I walked into the kitchen, into the cafeteria, and turned around, saw this guy sitting on the couch, and realized it was him. He hadn't slept that night. And he told me he had a long night today, you know, we had a lot of work to do today. And I just saw how he worked, I saw the spirit, uh, how, how he was. And something unexplainable occurred to me, I couldn't explain it. 
I am not one to suck up to anybody. I don't like to suck up to anybody. I don't think a Muslim should suck up to anybody. I don't like to orbit around people who are prestigious. I like to to have not have that veil me. So I didn't. I'm not one to think about Hassanin and see how great he is and let me let me rationalize it and philosophize it and and nurture that feeling and listen to him all the time and he's my idol. I'm not like that. That's just me. I'm not saying it's right and it's wrong. But there was this love for him that came without me understanding why it came. It was increasing, this love on its own. I did not touch it. I did not think about it. I did not nurture thoughts that I would explain, you know, I'm forming an image of it. Nothing like that. Something that just came on its own. And I went to Hassanin on the day before, uh, before leaving. And I told Brother Hassanin, I want to thank you because you taught me what it would mean to love my Imam. The love that I have for you was an experience that explained to me what it would be like when I will love my Imam as I come closer to him. What would it be like? You, you learned, you taught that to me. And he just, he, 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 he was gonna cry. He just, just, he took it, he turned around. He doesn't like, he's also a strong man. He doesn't like anyone to see him cry. He just turned around. And, and walked away. It was very abrupt. We were just talking. He just turned around and walked away. What I want to express to you is there's the Allah plants love in the hearts of believers for the believers. And when somebody is glowing like this, that's Hassanin. But Imam Hussain is, is Hassanin gets his inspiration from Imam Hussain. A thousand men like Hassanin Rajab Ali get their inspiration from Imam Hussain. A million men like Hassanin Rajab Ali get their inspiration from Imam Hussain. Imam Hussain is the master of the youth of paradise. Now, the Ansar, they, they lived all of this, the Ansar. Much more than me, I just saw a glimpse of it. They lived it, they saw Imam Hussain, they prayed with him, they traveled with him, they saw how he acted, they saw how he read the Quran, they experienced it. They saw how he spoke of the Prophet, they saw how he resembled the Prophet, they loved Imam Hussain like anything, more than anything else, and they couldn't explain it, just like I couldn't explain it. This is the status of the men that we are here, the men and the women, and the children, and the old men as well, and the old women, all, all these people, that's what they're all about. And today, we're here to commemorate these people. So I want you guys all to bless me, by being in a room in which there are there's a crowd that is going to direct their heart towards Imam Hussain, their mind towards Imam Hussain and towards his helpers because these helpers they were average people like us we can be them we want to be them so without further ado I'm going to call upon our first speaker today Salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Brother Sadiq Hani, a key member in the Muslim youth of Montreal, one of the sons of Montreal, as we say in Arabic, Ibn al Balad. And uh, he has just returned from Hajj, and uh, he's going to share with us uh, his experience with one of the Ansar. I'll, I'll, I'll let him go ahead, proceed, accompanied by Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before I begin, as many of you already know, uh, Hamid Ali, also known as Abu Jabbar, to whom this event is dedicated, uh, passed away this week. I knew him on a personal level, and uh, he was definitely a great man. So to him, I would like us to read and dedicate Surah Al-Fatiha, Tasbiquha Salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Muhammad. 
I begin my speech with the recitation of a verse from the Holy Quran. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa idha sami'u ma unzila ila al-Rasul tara a'yunahum tafidu min al-dam' mimma 'arafu min al-haqq. يقولون ربنا آمنا فاكتبنا مع الشاهدين. When they, the Christians, hear what was revealed to the Messenger, you see their eyes flooding with tears as they recognize the truth therein. And they say, Our Lord, we have believed, so count us among the witnesses. صدق الله العلي العظيم. عطروا مجالسكم بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد. The message of Imam Hussein alayhi afdalu salatu was salam is not limited to the Islamic world. It is a message which transcends color, culture and creed. It is one of truth, justice and sacrifice and hence, to honor this universal message on this great day, I will briefly detail the final moments of a man. No, rather of a noble warrior who chose justice over tyranny, freedom over enslavement, who gave up his youth for honor, his Christian belief for that of Islam, and his life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt alayhum afdalus salatu was salam. A man whose newlywed wife had followed him to the grave and whose mother had taken a stance on the day of Ashura, forever engraved in the books of history and the minds of visionaries. That man is Wahab bin Abdullah al-Kalbi. Wahab is still a youth when he meets the Imam alayhi afdalu salatu was salam. He just got married and was on his way back home with his bride and mother. On his way, he crosses the caravan of Imam Hussein, where Wahab hears him give one of many speeches. He is impressed by Sayyidah Shuhada's personality, honesty, piety and knowledge. So he, along with his family, decide to follow the Imam until they reach Karbala. At that point, it becomes evident that remaining by Hussein alayhi afdalu salatu was salam's side means definite death. And so, Wahab discusses the situation with his mother one last time. He tells her that in his opinion, the Imam is on the just path and it would be cowardly and against all traditions of Arab chivalry and gallantry to leave the side of a man so isolated and surrounded by bloodthirsty enemies. And so, the mother reminds her son that this means definite death. At which Wahab replies, I know, but my heart tells me this is the right thing to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's words are ever truthful when he says in the Holy Quran, وَمَن يُؤْمِن بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَهُ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ And whosoever believes in Allah, he guides his heart, and Allah is knower of all things. And so the mother tells her son that they will stay with the Imam. Yet the Imam alayhi afdalu salatu was salam does not want Wahab to fight since he is a Christian and hence it is not an obligation upon him. Therefore he recites the shahadatain and hence becomes a Muslim. It is now his turn to enter the battlefield. As he confronts, as he confronts the enemy, he starts to recite war poetry saying, You better deny me not as I am the son of Al-Kalbi. You will see me and how fatal my strikes are. My assault and campaign are seeking my revenge and that of my companions. I repulse the attack in the wake of the attack, for my struggle in the battlefield is not a playing matter. He fights bravely, returns to his mother and asks her, asks her if she is pleased with him, to which she replies, May Allah be pleased with you, but I would really be pleased when I see you dying in action protecting Hussein, alayhi afdalu salatu was salam. At this point, his wife presses him to return to the battlefield. Surprised, he asks why she wants him to continue fighting when at first she was begging him not to. To which she replies, the cries and tears of the children of Hussein are killing me. And so he returns to the battlefield and fights ever more fiercely. Once wounded, he is surrounded by enemies from all sides and killed. His wife runs onto the battlefield, sits next to his body and weeps. Shimir is watching this heartbreaking moment. He then orders his slave to kill the woman, and he does, making her the first female martyr in Karbala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless their souls. Yet this family's hardship and trial does not end here. Umar bin Sa'ad seeks to crush Wahab's mother's feelings. He orders his soldiers to cut Wahab's head off and throw it to his mother. Now I ask you, dear brothers and sisters, how would you react if the head of your beloved son was to be thrown before you? 
what would you say to the man who committed such an act? Well, let me tell you how Wahab's mother reacted. She wipes off the dirt, kisses the forehead of her beloved son and says, what I give for the sake of Allah, I do not want back. To conclude, I leave you to ponder on this, brothers and sisters. How many of us would go to war today if asked to for the sake of Allah? No. How many would go to war for the sake of Allah if newly wed? No. How many would go to war for the sake of Allah if newly wed while tagging along our wives and mothers? No. How many would go to war for the sake of Allah if newly wed while tagging along our wives and mothers as Christians fighting for what seems to be a Muslim cause? And that is why we must never forget these honorable men and women that served, sacrificed, and died in Karbala for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In your, in your speech, I forgot to put it in. Thank you very much, Brother Sadiq. I want to ask for Brother Zain al Abidin to come forward. Zain al Abidin Ali. Brother Zain al Abidin is one of the key figures and inspirational characters that have move forward the uh, Muslim Youth Council here in Montreal for those who remember the Eid Festival those who remember the iftar that happened during the Pakistani floods and the previous events Brother Zain amongst others Alhamdulillah other sincere brothers and sisters uh, have been key in that and today we would like him to share his perspective accompanied by Salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Using this or this? Both? Okay A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim I begin, I don't, I don't think I needed um, such a big welcome from uh, Brother Jihad um, because this is actually one of the things I wanted to start off with is, is telling you all that I'm standing here before the podium in front of the Imam of our time, Imam al Sharif, and I hope to bring justice because I don't, have, I don't, I don't feel like I have brought enough justice um, towards the Imam, to the call of Imam Hussein, and by being here, um, saying the, the the word, the little that I have to say about one of the companions, I hope I could bring justice to the Imam and um, as well as serve the Imam of our team of our time. Uh, the character I've chosen, one of the Ansar of Imam Hussein, is actually one who is really honored. Honored not only from Imam Hussein, not from Imam Ali, but from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This character, Habib ibn Mudahir, many of you might have heard of him. I have heard of him since I was a child. But until I chose this character to see what this character had been through, then I realized how, what we are compared to Habib ibn Mudahir. Habib ibn Mudahir is such an honored man from Rasulullah that even when he was a youth, he would always be walking behind Imam Hussein, even as a child, to a point where Rasulullah one day has picked up, uh, has called on to Mudahir, the father of Habib, and told him, Ya Mudahir, do you know where your son, what position he has? Thank you. Yeah. And Mudahir was just wondering why Rasulullah was hugging and kissing the child. And he asked the, the, the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, why are you uh, honoring my child so much? And the Prophet, while he was hugging and kissing him, he was having tears down his eyes. He said, your son is one who will come to my Hussein to aid him one day. And this is before the battle of Karbala has been going on. And throughout his life, also Habib, he went onwards with Imam Ali throughout all the battles. He was always by the side of Imam Ali, alayhi salam. Until they got separated, 
Habib ibn Muzahir and uh, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Habib was in Kufa and um, Imam Hussein was in Medina at that time. He was, he was actually one of the first people, Habib, to sign the letter for the Imam to come to Kufa and save them from, the, from Abaydullah ibn Ziyad and, and the oppressive regime of Yazid. When Muslim ibn Aqil came to Kufa, one of the main supporters of Muslim ibn Aqil was Habib ibn Mudahir. He was one of the main supporters. And as you all know what happened in Kufa, when Muslim ibn Aqil came, all the people of Kufa, they were hypocrites and they let, let Muslim ibn Aqil down. They let him um, be thrown off a building onto the ground and he died. But yet, Hab Habib ibn Mudahir, he kept his faith strong and he kept his faith in uh, the Prophet and his family. This is just a brief history of, aside from, from all the long history of Habib, I'm just giving you the key um, points. When, uh, when, when Imam Hussain, when he reached to Karbala, he, he reached to Karbala and while he was passing on the weapons to everybody, there was one spear left. And that one spear, everybody was looking at it and asking the Imam, Ya Imam, who is this spear for? And he replied, this is for my childhood friend, Habib, Habib ibn Mudahir. The Imam knew that Habib was going to come. He sent him a letter to Kufa, and Habib managed to come. Along with Habib, his slave came. The slave of Habib was such an honorable person. Even when, when Habib wanted to free him in Kufa, the slave said, you're going to free me, but how can I not be a slave of the son of Fatima al-Zahra Regardless, so this is just a brief story I'm just telling you. Like I said before, it was, it's, it's, it's a really long, longer story than this, but um, these are the key points. And what I wanted to see, from, what, what, I wanted, what I understood from all of this, what I grasped from this, is the loyalty that this person, uh, that this person had towards um, the Prophet towards Islam, towards the Quran, towards the Ahlul Bayt, the loyalty. Since he was a child, he had loyalty towards um, the truth. And this loyalty is not something that is so easy to have towards um, one another. Whether it's towards our friends, our families, you know, Anybody, it's not as easy to grasp it. If you think about it, this person, it's not just a friend that he was loyal to. He was loyal to the Imam. Right now, we might be loyal to our families. We might be loyal to a friend, one specific friend. We might be loyal to our wives. We might be loyal to our fathers. Just one person. But how loyal are we to the call of Imam Hussein? How loyal are we to the call of the Imam al-Mahdi. You know, one, one, I just have a, a story to share with all of you. I, I was at a friend's house in, in Ottawa one day. And we just kept talking. We were just having a, a heated you know, discussion until I, I recognized the picture in his room. He was, it, was, it was a picture of a man with such a bright face and his head down as if he was going to cry, as if he was crying. So much, such a sad and deep in, you know, feelings. And I, I just looked at this picture and I didn't really grasp the significance right away until I asked my friend, you know, what's this picture all about? And he told me, you know, this is the Imam of our time, Imam Zaman, Imam Mahdi Ajallah Ta'ala Faraj Sharif. This is him crying, crying because of us, because of our actions as Muslim, as so-called Shias, I would say. We are followers of their bit, but, you know, being a Shia is, is, is the next status. So the Imam is crying for us to be able for, for his reappearance to come. So, loyalty, um, if we learn from Habib bin Mudahir, our loyalty should stand towards um, what the Imams want from us. The Imams are waiting for all of us right now. And actually, Imam Mahdi is waiting for us. And I feel that I am in no way preparing myself towards the Imam for him to come. And I say this about myself because I don't feel it's, it's just that I, I share a message with everybody else before I started with myself. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that God, would, God will not change a whole society with, if you do not um, change what is within yourself. So I just ask 
for myself and everybody else that if we really truly want the Imam of our time to appear and we truly want to be amongst his soldiers, um, then we do have a big duty of preparing for the Imam to come. I mean, the Imam is not waiting. He's not going to just appear if we're not prepared for him. You know, it's like uh, I don't. I, don't I, I was speaking to a brother yesterday, and we were talking about the issue of of the Imam, and. He, he told me a very nice um, analogy. He said, when you have a president of a country, when he comes, okay, he will not step somewhere unless it's so secure or where, every, where there's everybody. So for example, if we look at the Prime Minister of Canada, let's say he's coming to Montreal, the preparation will come into securing the whole city around, making sure everybody's aligned properly, and there will be the systematic um, organization and it's the same way that we should be with our Imam. We should have a systematic organization in terms of how we need to prepare ourselves um, for the Imam to appear. Um, I guess this, this is all I have to say and share. And uh, please excuse me if I took too much of the time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Brother Zin. Thank you very much, Brother Zain. I am going to now ask once again uh, Brother Mustafa Diwani to come forward and share with us some eulogies about our beloved Imam Hussein and the ones that were with him. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.